At 27, my family began pressuring me to get married. I abruptly broke up with my girlfriend of three years and started returning to my hometown for blind dates. A friend asked me, you like Willow so much, can you really let her go? I scoffed, I'm not stupid, she's fine for dating and having fun, but if I really married her, wouldn't I be miserable for life? Suddenly, a cold yet familiar voice came from beside me. So that's the reason you dumped me. Chapter 1. Dragging my luggage home. I happened to run into a man walking out the door. He wore a black casual jacket, high top Martin boots, and had old school skull tattoos on his arms. I recognized him as the guitarist from Willow's band, I think his name is Makoto, a young guy in his early 20s. Strong and vigorous. Instinctively, I stopped behind the corridor door and didn't go out. After a while, Willow emerged from behind him wearing a tight, low-cut short dress. She leaned against the wall with dreamy eyes and lit a cigarette. Her damp long hair hung casually over her shoulders, a few droplets sliding down her strands, winding past her delicate collarbone. Moments later, she walked lightly behind him, her fingertips brushing his neck. In a voice full of temptation, she said, Why are you in such a hurry to leave? As she spoke, she stood on tiptoe, slowly leaned in, and planted a gentle kiss on his lips, leaving a barely there touch. She said, Next time you come, Big Sis will wear a maid outfit to play with you. Makoto's eyes lit up. He tightly embraced her waist and returned the kiss. After a lingering moment, he said, You're so playful. I'm afraid I'll end up dying in your hands sooner or later. Amidst their entanglement, Willow tugged at his lapel, trying to pull him back into the room. However, Makoto seemed a bit anxious and said, Willow, I have a gig to perform later. Willow stepped back from him, half sulking, half coquettish, and said, So heartless, you were calling me baby just now, and now you're leaving. She didn't get angry. Instead, she happily blew Makoto a kiss and said, I'll be waiting for you, see you tomorrow. After he left, I walked out from behind the corridor door. Willow didn't seem to expect me to return suddenly. She was stunned for a moment, but her expression quickly returned to normal. Why didn't you tell me you were coming back? I looked at her for a moment and replied, It's too late. I was afraid calling would disturb your rest. The ambiguous red marks on Willow's neck were still fresh, but she didn't feel guilty at all. She took my arm and led me inside. George. I'm so hungry, make me something to eat. She pouted while turning on the TV on the sofa, as if nothing had happened earlier. Seeing that I hadn't moved for a long time, Willow frowned and asked, what's wrong? Then, as if realizing something, a seductive smile appeared in her alluring eyes. Did you miss me? She got up and pressed herself tightly against me. The scent of iris lingered ambiguously around my neck, and her hand slowly slipped into my waistband. She said, then why don't you have me first, and then eat? Her long fingers honed from years of playing bass, were slender and nimble, bringing a slight cool touch as they glided over my skin. I closed my eyes and wearily pushed her away. I did enjoy Willow's body. When I pursued her, it was mainly because of her stunning looks, but perhaps because I had just finished a long flight, or maybe because of that man earlier. I only felt exhausted now, with no mood at all. Willow was rarely rejected by me. After a moment's surprise, her face darkened slightly and she asked, What's wrong? I looked down and saw a black lump on the carpet. It was a torn, tattered pair of stockings. Willow obviously saw the stockings too. A flash of panic crossed her eyes. She quickly bent down and grabbed the stockings in her hand. She didn't look at me again. Her lips trembled slightly as if wanting to say something. But she remained silent in the end. An awkward silence filled the living room. I took a cigarette from the pack and lit it. The crisp sound of crushing the menthol bead echoed as it broke. She whispered. His lease expired. And he had nowhere to stay. So I let him stay here for a night. There's nothing between us. I looked at Willow, our gazes met, but were obscured by the white smoke. We couldn't see each other's expressions, but we both knew how lame that excuse was. This wasn't the first time Willow had cheated. She was probably naturally flirtatious. She was like this when I first met her. Back then, a few of my dorm buddies were crazy about rock music and insisted on taking me to see a well-known rock band's performance. They said the band's female bassist was an absolute stunner, and it wasn't easy to get tickets. I had never been interested in rock music and was always unenthusiastic until Willow took the stage. She wore a tight leather dress, with black garter stockings faintly visible at her thighs, the laces winding around, her soft skin slightly bulging, full of tension. Her long hair was casually draped, curly red locks appearing particularly dazzling under the stage lights. As soon as she appeared, she became the focus of the crowd. She lifted her eyes, the hazy lights reflecting in her amber-like pupils, carrying a subtle allure. That face was the most expensive luxury. It was my first time attending a band performance. The fans below the stage were going wild, their shouts nearly breaking the roof, scanning over the boisterous crowd. Our eyes met for an instant before she quickly looked away. The music that night was great, but I didn't hear any of it, because at that moment, 
All was silent. I could only hear my own pounding heartbeat. After the show, a few buddies rushed backstage to get contact information, and I was among them. Single for 23 years, it was the first time I actively asked a girl for her contact. Willow didn't refuse anyone, flamboyantly scanning everyone's QR codes. A year later, all her suitors had given up. Only I persisted. Later, perhaps my perseverance finally moved her. Willow accepted my confession, and I became her boyfriend. Up until now, but I knew that in these years together, Willow had never truly liked me. Or perhaps she did like me, for my tolerance and generosity. She had cheated on me many times. But each time, as long as she gave me a somewhat acceptable excuse, I would forgive her. She had told me many times that I wasn't her type. She was only with me because I treated her well. She also joked that when she found her true love someday, she'd dump me. Our relationship had lasted over the years only because of my constant concessions. I said, you promised me you wouldn't cheat again. My voice was hoarse as I looked at the torn Balenciaga logo stockings in her hand. A trace of mockery flashed in Willow's eyes. Without any shame, she said. You believed that when I was just joking. She snorted coldly, took the cigarette from my fingertips, and said with disdain in her eyes, Can't take it, if you can't, we can break up. She had said this to me countless times before. She knew I couldn't bear to leave her. So over time, she learned how to manipulate me. She knew that when she said this, I'd be helpless. I turned my head and said, I'm tired, I'm going to rest. Willow frowned and grabbed my sleeve. She bit her lip and said, George, don't push me. I pried her hand off and went back to my room. Soon after, the door slammed loudly outside. Willow had left. She was angry. I knew. After all, between us, I always placated her and had never shown her such an attitude before. I turned over and opened my phone. In the family group chat, my mom had sent a message mentioning me. I've never rushed you before, but you're 27 now. It's time to think about marriage, right? My colleague's daughter is quite decent. I saw her, and she's good looking too. Why don't you come back during the holidays to meet her? Then I opened a message from my boss. George, the branch office is in need of people right now. With your abilities, staying as a deputy manager is a waste. Are you interested in going to the branch as a manager? It will be tough to start building business initially, but it's up to you. My mom wanted me to go home for a blind date. The company had just opened a branch, in my hometown. The timing and circumstances seemed right. I really had no reason to stay here. I sighed. Actually, I really did like Willow. She was beautiful, had a great figure, and we were very compatible in bed. Most importantly, she was wild. Being with her was easy because I didn't have to think about being responsible for her or consider our future together. When I first started working, I was exhausted and wanted someone to relieve my stress. But I was just average looking and couldn't find anyone suitable until I met Willow. She spent her best years with me, easing a lot of my stress with her body while I was working tirelessly for my career. And although her relationships with men were ambiguous, she was careful in this aspect. Before being with her, I heard that any men she dated had to show a health certificate from within the past three days. I always took precautions, so I wasn't worried about diseases. It would be hard to find another woman as perfect for me as her in the future, but there's nothing I can do. Dating is one thing. Settling down in marriage is another. I really liked Willow, but I also knew clearly that she wasn't suitable as a life partner. Now, it's time for me to make a decision. Chapter 2. Willow didn't come back all night. In the following days, she didn't appear before me. She ignored all my messages and calls. When I tried again, I received only a red exclamation mark. She had blocked me. This had happened a few times before. Willow was a master of the silent treatment. Each time, I'd have to humble myself and coax her for a long time before she'd show me a kind face. But this time, I was busy handing over my work and had no time to appease her. That evening, as I was booking a flight back to my hometown, my phone suddenly rang. It was one of Willow's friends calling. The other end was noisy, men and women laughing and joking incessantly. And the music blaring through the phone was overwhelming. They said, George. Willow is drunk. Can you come pick her up? Willow loved going to nightclubs and bars. Her family was wealthy. The band was her hobby. Not a means to earn a living. But even during holidays, she rarely went home. When I asked her why, she said there were too many rules at home. She preferred this kind of unrestrained life. Anyway, her grandfather doted on her and sent her money regularly. She wanted to spend more time doing what she loved. So Willow lacked any career ambition. In this aspect, we had nothing in common. Every time I told her about securing a project or getting a promotion at work, she always seemed uninterested. She once scoffed, saying, what's the point of working yourself to death for that little monthly pay, it wasn't even enough to buy her a bag. I knew that fundamentally, we were not the same kind of people. Apart from physical compatibility, we had no common topics. I didn't care about her soul, I just liked her body. She ignored my inner world, merely accustomed to my tolerance. Perhaps it's for the best, this way, 
When we part, neither of us will be hurt. I thought for a moment and said okay, hung up the phone, and looked out the window. The city at night seemed even more splendid than during the day. Thousands of lights and endless traffic, various illuminations intertwining, obscuring all the stars in the sky. I glanced at my ticket, the day after tomorrow at 8 a.m. I sighed. Actually, I didn't want to break up so soon. Willow and I were really in sync in bed. With the pressure of changing companies these days, I had planned to have a farewell fling with her. I smacked my lips, feeling a bit regretful. But since the opportunity had come, there was nothing I could do. When I arrived at the bar, Willow was drinking merrily with her bandmates, men and women of all kinds, all sharing the common trait of dressing avant-garde and fashionably. No wonder Willow liked hanging out with them. I looked down at my own cheap attire and recalled Willow's disdainful words. You're only 27. Stop saving money every day like a miser. Look at the clothes you wear, no taste at all. So old-fashioned. Living like this is really meaningless. You should go out and see the world more. Try new things. Look at the handsome guys in our band. Which one doesn't have tattoos? I asked you to tattoo my name, and it's like I'm asking for your life when we're out. Don't stay too close to me. I'm embarrassed to say you're my boyfriend. Snapping back to reality. I said nothing. Standing outside the crowd, locking eyes with Willow, she acted as if she didn't see me and quickly looked away. Willow's face was flushed, her whole body pressed tightly against Makoto. In a sticky voice, she said, Naughty boy, have another drink. Makoto, on the other hand, seemed a bit reserved, smiling somewhat awkwardly. The next moment, Willow raised her eyebrows, looking stunning yet devoid of warmth. She said, Drinking like this is no fun. Why don't you feed me? Hmm. Makoto asked. How should I feed you? Willow didn't speak. Just looked up at him. Half a second later, Makoto understood. A hint of excitement flashed in his eyes. He tilted his head back and down the caramel-colored whiskey in his glass. Then he hooked Willow's chin and kissed her fiercely. The two kissed passionately, seemingly venting their desires fully. Willow tilted her head back to receive him. Her eyes gradually moistening from lack of oxygen. Liquor spilled from the corners of their mouths reflecting a dreamy hue under the lights. Only after a long time did they part, a long string of silver connecting them. The atmosphere around us exploded instantly. Everyone was screaming and cheering. I knew she was doing it on purpose. She wanted to punish me. Punish me for giving her the cold shoulder that day and not coaxing her afterward. It wasn't until I walked up to Willow that everyone noticed me and gradually quieted down. Willow looked up and asked blandly, What are you doing here? Looking at her face, I vaguely recalled the days when we were intimately close. When our feelings were strong, we had spoken of love. Does it hurt? Maybe a little. But how much does it hurt? Not much. Really. After all, I always knew Willow was like this. Fickle. Endlessly pursuing excitement. Selfish. Probably spoiled since childhood. Always self-centered. Never considering others' feelings. I said deliberately. Word by word. Willow. You've gone too far. Willow looked up at me. Clearly. She was sitting and I was standing. Yet I felt as if she were looking down on me. She still had that indifferent expression, with a mocking smile, too far, if it's too much for you, you can break up, no one's stopping you, I said nothing, just looked at her, I couldn't count how many times she'd threatened me with breaking up, 50 times, or a hundred times, some friends nearby also felt she had gone too far, after all, everyone had seen how I'd treated her over the years, they whispered to her, Willow, don't say that, George treats you so well, saying that really hurts him, in fact, I was indeed hurt, my eyes moistened, and I closed them in sorrow. After all, if you're going to act, you have to go all the way. After much effort, when that tear finally fell to the ground, I clearly saw Willow's expression change. Her fingers tightened around her wine glass, but she still didn't speak, just looked at me coldly. The next second, I said softly, all right, Willow, let's break up then. Willow's face instantly turned extremely ugly, like a volcano about to erupt. However, she suddenly laughed, though her smile looked like she was gritting her teeth. She said, Fine. George, you've grown some backbone. Huh. All right. But I never go back to old flames. Just don't come begging me like a lapdog when the time comes. Okay. I nodded painfully. Then I turned and left, not looking back at her. That night, Willow didn't come home. I deleted all her contact information and anything related to her overnight, and packed my luggage. Early the next morning, I boarded the earliest flight back to my hometown. As the plane soared above the clouds, I pulled out my SIM card and threw it into the waste bag. Chapter 3. I didn't contact Willow again. After posting a few late-night emo statuses on social media to craft the image of a wounded soul, I decisively put her out of my mind. Life back in my hometown was routine. I quickly adapted to the new company's operations and met the woman my parents had arranged for me. The girl sitting across from me was only 25, but her makeup was so thick it looked like plaster. As soon as she sat down, she started chattering incessantly. 
She said, I think the most important thing for a man is to earn money to support his family. My ex-boyfriend said that when a man earns money, he should spend it on his woman. After marriage, the salary card must be handed over, because men will turn bad when they have money. My ex-boyfriend said he was willing to pay a dowry of 880,000 yuan to marry me and add my name to the house deed. After all, as a woman marrying into his family, I need a little security. He also said that men who talk about gender equality are all chauvinists because reality is inherently unequal. Women have to bear children, and men can't give birth for women. I listened to her babbling, smiling as I held my coffee cup, thinking I must hold back and not lower myself to her level. So I nodded and asked, then why didn't you marry your ex-boyfriend? She was left speechless, stammering, because my ex-boyfriend said our personalities weren't compatible. Maintaining my smile, I said, Miss Shu, I think your ex-boyfriend was wrong. After marriage, not only should the salary card be handed over, but the beneficiary of any insurance should be the woman. I believe that if I'm willing to marry someone, I should give as much dowry as I can afford, and the house should be directly registered under the woman's name. Would that satisfy you, Miss Shu? Really, Mr. George? I stood up, sighed, and said, Unfortunately, Miss Shu, I think our personalities might not be very compatible. Let's not continue this. Then I turned and left. Having been back home for so many days, my mother had introduced me to quite a few potential matches, some of whom were actually quite decent. However, having once seen the vast ocean, it's hard to appreciate mere streams. After a failed relationship, I wasn't interested in anyone. This state continued until a work meeting. Everyone arrived early, silently gathered around the conference table, the atmosphere solemn. I quietly asked the deputy manager next to me, what's going on, did something happen at the company, he leaned over and whispered, the old chairman's daughter is coming, I heard she's here to get some experience, if she passes the test, she'll skip over her brother and take over the entire group, also, don't underestimate her because she's a woman, this lady is decisive and bold in her actions, a Harvard graduate, after graduation, she started her own finance company and made 3 million overnight, be careful, women like her aren't easy to deal with, watch what you say to her, before long, a woman wearing a black strapless mermaid dress walked into the office. The dress hugged her curves, accentuating her figure. She casually wore a women's black blazer over it. As she entered, someone behind her took her coat. The crisp sound of her high heels clicking on the floor ceased. I looked up, and not just me, everyone's gaze was instantly captured by her. At first glance, it felt as if the air in the entire room had stilled with her presence. Her gaze swept over every corner. The moment her fingers brushed across the table, the air began to flow again carrying an elegant and captivating aura. Only upon a second look did I notice her clear crescent-shaped eyes. Her jet-black long hair was neatly tied up, revealing a slender neck and a few strands of hair hanging by her ears. She was extremely beautiful, on par with Willow, but her strong aura made it hard for people to notice her appearance at first glance. Sorry, my flight was delayed, so I'm late. She first acknowledged her mistake, then sat at the head of the table and got straight to the point. My name is Anna, and from now on, I'll be the general manager of the company. I've already reviewed the company's basic information and financial statements. Starting with the deputy manager, I'd like each of you to give me a basic report on your work achievements over the past year and the projects you're currently handling. One by one, the department heads nervously began their reports. As rumored, Anna was indeed an elite. Pointing out every attempt to gloss over details, she said, I don't like vague statements, nor do I like being fooled. I hope we can communicate well, but if my communication doesn't work, I'll consider other methods. She clearly didn't scold or hit anyone, yet cold sweat formed on everyone's backs. Even when I stood up, my palms were slightly damp. Fortunately, I was well prepared, and my work over the past year was quite outstanding. The more I spoke, the more confident I became. My education and career are my pride and the most important things in my life. I never deceive myself in these areas. Anna didn't interrupt me. I saw a hint of appreciation in her eyes. After a moment, I stopped, indicating that I had finished. She nodded and said, George, right, not bad. From now on, everyone should report their work according to this standard. Since Anna arrived, everyone's workload increased. She cleared out a lot of redundant tasks and bad assets and negotiated many high-quality projects. Everyone worked overtime more and more, but their salaries increased accordingly. The male colleagues were all very interested in a domineering female CEO like Anna. Two old hands. Not sure what got into them, maybe they've watched too many online short dramas about female CEOs, one morning, in front of everyone, one mistakenly called the boss, wife, and said that if he was fined, he would get an annual membership card, that afternoon, another one tried to forcefully pin Anna against the wall in the office, the first one was fired that morning, the second one was sent directly to the police station that day, the colleagues all behaved after that, but during lunch breaks, you could still hear everyone discussing her, 
Don't be fooled by her looks. I heard she's never even had a boyfriend. Impossible. Have you watched too many TV dramas? A woman like her, with that face and figure, you've got to be kidding. Believing she's single is like believing I'm Napoleon. Listening nearby, I suddenly became interested. Chapter 4. I began to appear regularly in front of Anna. She arrived at work half an hour early every day, so three out of five days a week, I'd catch the same elevator as her. At that time, it was usually just the two of us. I didn't say much, just greeted her, helped press the elevator buttons, and stood aside. Then, without fail, I'd go get a cup of coffee every noon. She usually came to get coffee at that time too. I'd make sure not to bump into her in the break room, leaving before she arrived but ensuring she could see me. Occasionally, I'd work overtime, and she would pass by my desk on her way out. So, when she saw me working overtime for the seventeenth time, she paused and walked over to me, asking, I've noticed you've been working overtime a lot lately. Is there a problem? I looked up in apparent surprise. After hesitating for a moment, I handed over the documents in my hand and said, I recently took over a new project, but there are some assets in the company whose risks I'm unsure about, so I have to study them more. Anna naturally sat down beside me. She softly said, let me have a look. She had a faint rose fragrance about her, an indescribable subtle allure. She nodded and said, I think this project is feasible. Look at their 2023 financial statements. Their financial situation isn't bad. And also, she spoke earnestly. I nodded attentively, occasionally raising some highly technical questions. Looking at her pensive profile, I couldn't help but curl my lips slightly. Later, she pointed to the little orange cat in my hand and curiously asked, What's this? I squeezed it while handing it over and said, It's a stress ball. When I'm stressed or can't figure things out, I squeeze it to relieve pressure. Would you like to try it? Anna. She gently took it, carefully squeezed it twice, her almond-shaped eyes sparkling. The next moment, she suddenly realized something, quickly retracting her innocent expression, handing the orange cat back to me. She said, finish up early, otherwise, people will think I'm a heartless slave driver who forces employees to work overtime all the time. I nodded, packed up my materials, and went downstairs with her. As we stepped outside, raindrops blown by the wind splattered onto Anna. She hesitated and stepped back. I opened my umbrella and turned back to ask, Anna, didn't you bring an umbrella? Shall I walk you over? The company's parking lot was across the street. To get to her car, she'd have to cross the overpass. She nodded somewhat embarrassedly and stepped under my umbrella, keeping a small distance between us. So I didn't hesitate to tilt the umbrella more toward her side. Rainwater slid off the edge, soaking my shoulder. Anna obviously noticed my gesture, glanced up at my damp sleeve, and a subtle look of conflict appeared on her face. The next moment. She pressed her lips together and moved closer to me, her shoulder lightly touching my arm. The rain pelted the ground as we walked a bit closer. Warm body heat subtly transmitted through our clothes, and her rose fragrance filled the air. When Anna drove her car out of the parking lot, I hadn't gone far. Anna rolled down the window and asked, You didn't drive today, did you? I chuckled awkwardly and said, Yeah, I forgot to drive today. It's okay, Anna. I'll just catch a cab home, she said. Get in, I'll give you a ride, along the way. I talked quite a bit with Anna. She was somewhat surprised to find that our interests aligned, even sharing a fondness for the niche film The Holy Mountain. Anna's initially indifferent demeanor gradually became more lively. When we reached my doorstep, she actually didn't break and drove past. I was about to remind her when she realized, sorry, I wasn't paying attention to the navigation. After the car stopped, I thanked her again for giving me a ride home. Anna just nodded. Her lips parted slightly as if she wanted to say something, but she swallowed her words. What's wrong, Anna? She asked, where did you get that little orange cat stress ball earlier? It's so cute. As soon as she said it, she seemed a bit regretful, as if her cool and elegant CEO image was slipping. She simply lowered her head and said nothing. I chuckled, and the next moment, I pulled out the big orange cat from my pocket and placed it in her hand. I waved and said, well then, Anna, see you tomorrow. Chapter 5 I stood behind the curtain, watching Anna leave, and picked up a notebook from the table. I hadn't driven to work in a long time just to seize this opportunity, and thankfully, today's weather forecast was accurate, it really did rain. I flipped open the notebook, filled with records of Anna's preferences, there wasn't much information about her, it took me a lot of effort to find her old social media account from school and carefully note down each detail, just to learn a bit about her likes and dislikes, for example, she loved chubby orange tabbies, and that movie The Holy Mountain which I had only just watched last night. There's no choice for an average guy like me to win over an exceptional woman like her. I have to put in the extra effort. I smirked, just about to rest on the bed when my phone rang. It was an unfamiliar number, but the voice was unmistakable. Willow spoke coldly. You left a lot of your stuff at my place. Come get it. Otherwise, I'll throw it all out. When I moved out, 
I did leave some things behind, but they were just useless items that took up space. I figured, given Willow's temperament, she'd have thrown them out immediately. I didn't expect her to call me. So, I said, just throw them out. I don't need them. I said it while flipping through the notebook about winning Anna over. My tone somewhat dismissive. Willow on the other end was clearly unhappy. After a long silence, she hung up. She was always like this, moody and constantly needing someone to comfort her. But now, I no longer had any obligation to do so. After blocking her number, I put the whole thing out of my mind. Since I spent time with Anna yesterday, I couldn't use the same approach again today. I rarely left work early, but today I went to a bar with a friend for a few drinks. After a few rounds, we were both a bit tipsy. My friend squinted at me and asked, You used to be so into Willow, and now you've suddenly broken up. Are you really over it? When I was with Willow, my friends often scolded me, thinking I was too much of a simp and had no self-respect. But I never thought much of it. If I was with Willow for her body, then I had to give something in return. Besides, being a simp or not was my decision. How does that make me weak? I put down my glass and said, she was only good for a fling. I'm not stupid, I wasn't going to marry her and be miserable for the rest of my life. My friend gave me a thumbs up. Damn, you've got the right mindset. You're right, you had her at her best, and now you're above it all. The next second, he stopped talking his face going pale as he looked behind me in shock. Am I seeing things? Or have I had too much to drink? A faint laugh came from behind me, chilling my bones and instantly sobering me up. George, is this why you dumped me? I turned around stiffly. Willow, dressed in a silky white blouse, was leaning against the wall, her gaze icy. My friend, showing no loyalty, slipped away immediately. Willow dragged me to an empty hallway, glaring at me with such anger that I half expected her to kill me in the next moment. I spoke first. What are you doing here? You didn't come just for me, did you? Willow gritted her teeth. George, if you don't have a mirror at home, you could at least use some water to see your reflection, couldn't you? I came with the band for a gig. If I hadn't run into you by chance, I wouldn't have known that all these years. I was just a plaything to you. I quickly replied. I was just joking around with a friend. You know how much you hurt me. I'm someone who needs my dignity too. I turned away, but she yanked my ear, forcing me to face her. George. Have you always thought I was stupid? Yes, I silently answered, freeing my ear from her grip. I spoke calmly. Willow, no matter what, I did my best for you these past years. You know that. I have no regrets, but you kept letting me down. Even if I did use you, it wasn't for nothing. Didn't my youth count for anything? We've come this far. Let's part peacefully. At least, I hesitated, unable to bring myself to say in love. So instead, I said, at least we had something good. Willow looked at me for a long time. Just when I thought she'd get angry. She suddenly smiled. Under the lights, she looked as beautiful as ever, but I no longer felt anything. Even the most beautiful sight grows tiresome after a thousand days and nights. She said, George, you think too highly of yourself. With a slight smirk, she added, of course, we'll part peacefully. Did you think I'd still cling to you? Just remember, it wasn't you who dumped me, it was me. Willow, who dumped you? With that, she turned and walked away as if leaving behind something filthy. I watched her back and sighed quietly. Willow had never been dumped in her life, so maybe being dumped by me frustrated her, but if thinking that way made her feel better, I didn't mind. Chapter 6 I kept up my usual long hours at work, and Anna stayed later each day. Sometimes we even rode home together. The cool, crisp air of early winter had arrived, and as we passed through the city with its stream of headlights, people were bundled in coats. The chill seeming to increase the distance between everyone, making us instinctively want to draw closer. We talked about work projects and what we'd been up to recently. I'd complain about people and things at partner companies, and she'd indignantly agree. Yeah, I think that person is really disgusting too, and we'd both laugh. Over time, I could sense her feelings for me growing. So, on the day of the first snowfall, I decided to make a bold move. I asked her for some time off, and when she asked why, I hesitated and said, Family matters. Technically. This should have ended the conversation, but Anna frowned. Is something wrong at home? Is there anything I can help with? I smiled awkwardly. No, it's just, my mom's forcing me to go on a blind date. Anna was stunned. It was rare to see such an expression on her face. I added, I'm already 27. My family has been pressuring me a lot. I kept putting it off, but I can't avoid it this time. After a long pause, Anna looked down and said, Fine, but you know the company's really busy right now, so I can only give you... She pretended to check her watch. Two hours. I think that's enough time for a date. All right. You have one hour and 59 minutes left. I wasn't lying to Anna. I really did have a blind date. With my previous ones going nowhere, my mom was getting close to losing it. This time, the person I was meeting had potential, a well-traveled professional. Elegant, thoughtful, and respectful of others' opinions. Without a hint of entitlement, 
I found myself interested and chatted with her a bit longer than usual. Halfway through, she went to the restroom, and I was playing on my phone when I felt someone sit down in front of me. I looked up, my words caught in my throat. It was Willow. She crossed her long legs and glared at me disdainfully. You broke up with me to go on dates with this kind of person. My smile faded. Weren't you supposed to be on tour with the band? Why are you still here? The schedule changed. She replied. You think I wanted to stay in this dump? I spoke firmly. I hope you can respect my date. She's a good person. Please leave and don't interfere. Willow's smile disappeared. Her lips pressed tightly together. When my date returned, she was bewildered by the scene. Who are you? Willow ignored her. Seething. I'm his girlfriend. If you know what's good for you, leave. I hurried to explain. No, she's not. I. But Willow leaned in, tightly holding my arm. What? Do you need us to kiss right now to prove it to you? By the time I managed to push her away, my date was already storming off, her face full of anger. I was furious. Willow, what's your problem? We're over. Willow, lounging on the sofa, looked maddeningly smug. That was your decision. I never agreed. Dating isn't marriage, I shouted. It doesn't require both parties to agree. You even said you'd never go back on your word. I changed my mind, Willow said lightly, as if discussing what to have for dinner. I think you're good at taking care of me. I was comfortable with you, so I don't want to break up anymore. In that moment, all I could do was laugh out of disbelief. But I'm not comfortable, she retorted. You got to have me at my best. What do you have to complain about? She raised her voice, drawing attention from the people around us. I quickly covered her mouth. Quiet. Willow shook her head and freed herself from my grasp, shouting. After breaking up with me, you haven't met anyone better, have you? You know in your heart I'm the best you'll ever get. We were great together in bed. Instead of those other losers, why not? Her words abruptly stopped as a dark figure appeared beside me. I snapped out of it. Seeing Anna still in her black fishtail dress from work, her brow furrowed. Weren't you here for a blind date? Why are you talking about sleeping together? I was utterly stunned. My plan had been for Anna to get jealous. But instead, Willow showed up and started causing trouble. And now Anna was here too. Willow stood up, annoyed, and faced her. I'm his girlfriend. Who are you to interfere? Anna calmly replied. I'm George's boss. And as far as I know. George doesn't have a girlfriend. Willow bit her lip, then snapped. He doesn't need to report to you whether he has a girlfriend or not. Oh, I see now. This is the new woman you've set your sights on. George, does she know how despicable you are? Are you planning to use the same tricks on her that you used on me? Even though I was usually calm, this pushed me to the edge. Just as I was about to retort, Anna spoke first. Oh, so you're the dumped ex. Since George broke up with you, it means he doesn't like you anymore. Clinging to him won't work. Willow's face turned red with rage. Anna looked at me and said, your time off is up, there's a meeting waiting for you at the office, let's go, I couldn't care about anything else anymore, I spoke to Willow, enunciating every word, I don't know what's gotten into you, but Willow, during the years we were together, I owed you nothing, we got together willingly, and I never forced you, I still stand by my words, let's part peacefully, please don't bother me anymore, Willow wanted to say something, but after hearing me out, her eyes darkened, and she said nothing more, Anna tugged on my sleeve, pulling me away, in the car, Anna asked indignantly, is that really your ex-girlfriend? I tried to change the subject. Didn't you say we have a meeting to attend? She repeated, was that woman really your ex? Yes, I sighed, running a hand over my face, forcing a bitter smile. We were together for three years. I used to like her a lot, but she kept cheating on me, and I just couldn't take it anymore. Part of why I went back home was because of our breakup. I was too hurt. Spending time with you recently, I glanced at Anna's expression, then added, feeling downcast has helped me feel better, but I never expected her to come back to cause trouble. Anna looked at me seriously and said, a girl like her doesn't deserve you, don't let your heart soften. Cheating once means there'll be a hundred times more. Her disloyalty shows she never truly loved you. You should find someone who'll love you wholeheartedly. I couldn't help the smile that formed on my lips, but I quickly suppressed it, keeping my voice sorrowful. But women like you are too rare. Where could I find someone like that? Anna's ears turned a soft shade of red, and she whispered, well, Maybe I'm the only one who deserves you. Chapter 7 Three days later, while I was drinking at a bar, Anna messaged me, asking when I was coming back to work. When she said that line the other day, I was indeed taken aback, but I didn't want to rush things. I was serious about Anna, so we couldn't just stumble into a relationship like I had with Willow. A rushed beginning always ends in a rushed conclusion. Taking this situation as an excuse, I took some time off and went out with friends to relax. This bar was one of the fancier spots in the city. Not too loud with a band playing great music. I was enjoying the sight of attractive people dancing and drinking with my friends when the music suddenly stopped. After a moment, the bass began to play. How long will I love you? As long as the stars shine above you. If I could, I would love you even longer. 
How long will I need you? As long as the seasons need time. The soft, melodic voice caught my attention, and I paused. Looking up at the stage, there stood Willow in a tight leather dress, a silver necklace glinting around her neck. In that instant, the rowdy crowd and dim lights seemed to vanish, and all I could see was her, with her eyes fixed on me. It was like our first meeting all over again. Only this time, it wasn't me who walked toward her. Willow slowly walked off the stage, approaching me. She said, want to add me on WeChat? The whole crowd erupted with cheers, but I shook my head and sighed. Why bother? I'm not undervaluing myself. I could see that Willow did have genuine feelings for me. But how much of that love was for who I am? Or was it just because I had always doted on her? Spoiled her? Tolerated her? Maybe. Deep down, she couldn't accept that the person she always thought of as her simp had dumped her. The crowd began to disperse, the music resumed, and she sat beside me, nudging me with a hesitant, almost appeasing look. I thought about what you said the other day, and you were right. In all the years we were together, you never wronged me. You gave so much, and I kept hurting you. It was only right for you to leave me. Her expression was conflicted. She seemed reluctant to speak, but she went on anyway, her voice shaky and uncertain. If I change, if I start caring about you, if I stop doing anything out of line with others, could we? Remembering her earlier vow about never going back, her face flushed bright red as she quickly looked down and said, Could we get back together? I'm sorry for everything. It was all my fault. I looked at Willow in surprise. I almost thought she had been possessed by someone else. The proud, confident Willow, apologizing and asking to reconcile with me. I knew this wasn't her style. Someone must have put her up to this. I asked, Who told you to do this? Willow bit her lip. My friends, after we broke up, they all told me I went too far and that I deserved a chase your man through hell moment. Her shame was reaching its limit as she asked again. So, will you take me back? I'm way better than those blind date prospects. After being with me, how can they compare? And your boss? She seems so dull, only ever talking about work. We've already been through three years together. We're the best fit. I stood up, finishing my drink in one gulp. No, thanks for the offer. The song was beautiful, but getting back together isn't an option. The air seemed to freeze. Willow pressed her lips together, her expression blank. Why? Willow had a pair of beautiful, expressive eyes. Even when unhappy, they always seemed to glisten with emotion. It was rare to see her look so cold. I smiled, because I never go back. Chapter 8. I volunteered for a business trip, spending a week out of town. The project negotiations went well, but during dinner that evening, one of the high-ranking officials from the other company made me very uncomfortable. George, how old are you now? A middle-aged man, balding and full of condescension, asked me, holding back my annoyance. I replied, I'm 27. I don't have much life experience yet, he said. At your age, how can you refuse a drink from your elders? He frowned as he pushed a glass toward me. I've met people like him before. If you don't do as they say, if you don't drink when they toast you, they think you're disrespectful and ungrateful. They feel the need to berate you, as if doing so would satisfy their self-proclaimed mentorship. I used to push myself to the limit for my career. Drinking at social events and working late until I ended up with a perforated stomach ulcer. The doctor had strictly forbidden alcohol, but the project we were negotiating was important, and I knew it was a crucial moment for Anna and her ability to take over the company. So, I forced myself to drink despite the pain. One toast after another, the burning sensation in my stomach intensified, sweat pooling in my hands. Just then, my phone rang, Anna was calling. Why is it so noisy? Are you still at dinner? I've already messaged your supervisor, if you're full. You need to leave. You can't drink any more. Got it. I didn't want to stay either. But the man, drunk and aggressive, insisted on keeping me there, demanding to talk. It's good to be capable, but you need to play the game. If you can't drink, the deal won't happen. Stop being so wishy-washy. Have another drink. He handed me another glass. The smell of alcohol made me hold my breath. I pushed the glass back. Mr. Zhang, my stomach isn't well. My supervisor is here. You can drink with him instead. He suddenly erupted yanking me up by my collar. You're just a department manager, what are you acting all high and mighty for? I've signed the contract with you, and now you're refusing to drink, do you think I'm not important enough for you, you bastard? He grabbed my collar and picked up a full bottle, trying to force it on me. My stomach was already in pain, and thankfully, several colleagues intervened, pinning him to his seat. My heart was pounding as I watched him curse at me from his chair. Between the physical and psychological strain, I couldn't hold back anymore. I vomited, Everything I'd eaten spilling all over him. The noise I made sounded almost like I was turning into a zombie. Mr. Zhang sat there, dumbfounded, with food still hanging off him. My colleagues were stunned too, backing away. The deputy manager frantically gestured at me, and I realized my phone call was still active. Damn it, Anna probably heard the whole thing. From my massive, disgusting wretch onwards, I sighed. Barely able to stand, I stumbled out, 
Anxiously picking up my phone again, silence greeted me. Anna wasn't there. There wasn't a single response. Back at the hotel, I was vomiting again, throwing up until the world spun, until all I had left was the sour bile from my stomach. Exhausted, I collapsed onto the bed. I thought Anna might at least call to check on me, but she didn't. Maybe she was mad, angry that I'd jeopardized such an important client. I wanted to sleep, but I couldn't. Lying in the dark, staring at the ceiling, I realized this was nothing new. I was used to it. I never had family support. I went to college with a student loan, scraping by with part-time jobs just to afford living expenses. I delivered food, run errands, no matter how unreasonable the customers were. I had to endure it. Still, I never made much. Things were better now, at least the money was real. Time ticked by, and there was no word from Anna. I turned over, bitterly smiling. What more was there to understand? After this mess, she was probably furious and promising the client she'd have me fired. It's only fools who deceive themselves, who think someone still cares about them when all the signs say otherwise, and I wasn't about to be that fool. Suddenly, my mother came to mind. Since the day I was born, I'd rarely seen my father. He seemed to embody every human flaw, he gambled. Drifted from place to place, constantly cheated, and whenever he came home, it was only to ask for money. If my mom refused, he'd beat her, and sometimes me too. I started begging my mom for a divorce as soon as I was old enough to understand. Everyone around us urged her to leave him, but every time, she'd sniffle and sob, saying she wanted me to have a complete family, refusing to divorce him no matter what. I couldn't understand it at first. He treated us so horribly, how could she think staying together was better for me? Eventually, I realized it wasn't about me at all, she didn't want to leave him, and I was just the excuse, whenever she found out about his affairs, she'd throw a fit, screaming and threatening to end it all with him, but when he actually wanted to leave, she'd panic, crying on her knees, begging him to stay, this endless cycle of misery turned my mother into someone with Stockholm Syndrome, she hated my father, but she couldn't live without him, and I grew up amidst that constant tug of war, from an early age, I knew I had to rely on myself, Fight tooth and nail to take control of my destiny, in my career, in my relationships. I wouldn't get back with Willow. People don't change their true nature. No matter what promises they make, a simp gains nothing in the end. I wasn't about to repeat my mother's tragedy, but did I really like Anna? I didn't even know. Maybe I just liked how attractive she was, how much simpler she seemed compared to Willow. I was willing to go all out to win her over, but I knew such feelings were superficial. For the first time, I felt truly lost. Was this really what I wanted? A knock on the door pulled me out of my thoughts. Stumbling out of bed, I opened the door. Anna stood there, clearly exhausted from hours on the road, her face pale, her expression worn, but the moment she saw me, all her pent-up emotions seemed to explode, concern replaced by anger. Anna clenched her dress tightly, biting her lip. You know you can't drink, so why try to act tough? Drinking so much, do you not care if you live or die, do you know? I thought, I cut her off, but this deal is important for you. I didn't want to let you down at such a crucial time, what about you, don't you matter to me, if it costs me you, I don't want it, the intensity of her emotions made her voice tremble, realizing she might have said too much, she sniffled, trying to regain her composure, her tone shifted back to the usual aloofness, I've told the company to cancel the partnership, you'll never have to see that guy again, and he'll be blacklisted in the industry, she looked down, avoiding my gaze, continuing, it's still three hours until dawn, tomorrow's activities are cancelled, you can sleep in, I'll be next door, if you need anything, just come over, with that, she turned to leave, as if she'd traveled all this way just to say those few words, if I didn't act now, I'd be an idiot, so as she turned away, I reached out, pulling her into my arms, holding her shoulders as I leaned down, a faint scent of roses mingled as our lips met in a cool, gentle kiss, I smiled at Anna's flustered expression and asked, Anna, will you be my girlfriend, chapter 9, being with Anna felt completely different from being with Willow, she wasn't a clingy girlfriend, but she was always by my side when I faced difficulties, refusing to leave no matter how much I tried to convince her. She never said she missed me, but no matter how late I came home, I always found her waiting for me. The longer we spent together, the more I realized that beneath her icy exterior was a hidden warmth. I felt an unprecedented happiness, but also a deep fear. It was like standing on the edge of a cliff, solid ground beneath my feet, but a deep abyss behind me. I was afraid Anna would discover my true self that everything I did for her was just a carefully constructed facade, I was scared she would be disgusted by the real me, after several snowfalls, the temperature plummeted, feeling guilty, I wanted to make it up to Anna by working harder, pushing myself until I finally fell ill, after taking leave from work, I stayed home alone, Anna and I didn't live together, distance helped make the illusion seem real, in the midst of a fevered haze, I thought I heard the doorbell ring, I assumed it was a dream, 
But after several more rings, I forced my eyes open. When I opened the door, I saw Anna standing there. She was holding a thermal container in one hand and a bag of medicine in the other. Snowflakes dusted her black wool coat, and her long lashes were damp, tangled together with moisture. You got sick and didn't tell me, she said. She walked to the dining table, setting down the container. I made some porridge. I don't know if you like it. Before I could react, she stepped closer, standing on tiptoe to touch my forehead, then her own. Frowning slightly, she sat on the sofa, taking out the medicine, muttering in exasperation. Why do you always do this? You always tough it out, refusing to take medicine when you're sick. Is it a cold or the flu? It's nothing serious, probably just a cold. Anna took out a box of medicine, carefully reading the instructions. I stared at her in a daze, remembering the first time I met her. She had the same focused expression while reviewing a report I had submitted. We had once been so far apart. She was aloof and elegant, and I was just an ordinary employee, sitting far away from her with so many people between us. And now, here she was, right in front of me, frowning in concern over a tiny instruction leaflet. The soft orange light in the living room fell on Anna, her fitted knit sweater hugging her graceful figure, her collar slightly open, revealing her collarbone, subtly sensual. The warm light softened her otherwise cool makeup, giving her an added touch of gentleness. Suddenly, I felt my heart skip a beat the echo ricocheting in my head, I thought, I'm done for, I walked over and pulled her into my arms, she hugged me back briefly, then quickly grabbed a blanket, draping it over my shoulders, don't do this, you're still sick, but I hugged her even tighter, murmuring, what should I do, Anna, I think I'm falling for you more and more, she huffed, didn't you like me before, I was speechless, another loaded question, no, I mean, she snuggled into my chest, then burst into laughter, interrupting me, all right, stop explaining, because, I'm falling for you more and more too, I couldn't describe the feeling, I'd always valued rationality, and I believed emotion should serve as the material for rational thought, I disliked losing control, but now, it didn't seem so bad, after taking the medicine, I fell into a deep, dreamless sleep, when I woke up, I was drenched in sweat, the congestion in my head suddenly gone, I got out of bed, my first thought being to find Anna and tell her I was better, Anna, the next moment, I stood at the study door, meeting Anna's complicated gaze, she was holding the notebook where I had recorded all her preferences. She had already flipped through half of it. Chapter 10. Anna left. She wasn't angry, and she didn't argue with me. She didn't say anything, nor did she look at me again. I chased her to the hallway, wanting to call out to her, but no words came out. I still felt the lingering effects of the cold, but it hardly seemed to matter. My heart felt icy, as though the chill of winter had seeped into it. Two days later, I recovered and returned to work. I worked late as usual, went to the break room for coffee but I never ran into her. It turned out that if she really wanted to avoid me, I wouldn't see her at all. The constant messages we used to exchange on WeChat also fell silent. It was as if she'd completely forgotten me. Sometimes, I found bitter amusement in the fact that at least she hadn't fired me. Other times, I couldn't help but grit my teeth. It would have been better if she'd lashed out, taken her anger out on me. Even a fight would have been better, but I didn't look for her. Caught in the act, what else was there to say? Any explanation would be meaningless. I went back to my old routine, working alone, going home alone. It hadn't bothered me before, but after getting used to being with someone, suddenly being alone again felt unbearably lonely. Willow, somehow learning about my breakup, began showing up to pester me. After she blocked me at my door once again, I sighed. What do you want? Willow, I've told you, I won't get back together with you. Willow leaned against the doorframe, her silver earrings catching the light. She raised an eyebrow. Well, you're single now, why not give it another shot with me? What does she have that I don't? Look at my face. Look at these legs. And this. And this. Why do you have to like her? I didn't feel like arguing. Impatient. I replied. I just like her. What does that have to do with you? Willow laughed. Her voice tinged with icy mockery. You like her. But does she like you? She stepped closer. Biting her lip. She only liked the version of you that you pretended to be. But I. I like you just as you are. She's nothing like you. What's the point of pretending to have feelings? Her final words struck a nerve. She was right, my relationship with Anna had been built on pretense, but my feelings for her weren't fake. Still, as Willow had said, what did it matter? Anna wouldn't love me anymore. To her, being deceived like that was probably an unforgettable humiliation. George, we were meant for each other. Willow's voice was alluring, like a siren singing in the dead of night, ready to drag her prey into the depths. I opened my mouth, about to respond. When my phone suddenly rang, I looked down, it was a WeChat message. It was from Anna. Can we meet? I looked up at Willow. No. She blinked. Stunned. What? I said I won't get back together with you. I looked her in the eye. Speaking clearly and seriously. Willow. I don't love you. Chapter 11. After a few days without seeing each other, 
Anna hadn't changed at all. There were no signs of heartbreak, no anger from being deceived. The server took her off-white wool coat, revealing a black turtleneck sweater, her gaze downcast, hands gently folded. After a moment, Anna spoke. Did you use the same tactics on me as you did on others? I thought you would start by questioning why I deceived her, but I didn't expect this question, and I was momentarily at a loss. I replied, no, I hadn't. Not even with Willow had I put so much effort into understanding someone's preferences. Anna's expression remained unchanged, but her brows seemed to relax a little. I, I wanted to say that I hadn't meant to deceive her, but I couldn't get the words out, so I lowered my voice. I'm sorry for deceiving you. You have every right to be angry. If you don't want to see me anymore, I understand. I sighed and continued. I can resign. Anna frowned slightly, speaking softly. That's not why I'm here. I've been thinking these past few days. I can't lie to myself, I like you. Even though you deceived me, I still like you. She looked down, speaking earnestly. But a relationship built on pretense won't last. It took me a long time to realize that my feelings for you weren't because you liked the holy mountain or because you took me skiing in Hokkaido. I like you because, no matter what challenges you face, you never give up. Because you always have a clear plan for your life. You know what you want. And you're never swayed by outside influences. I like that part of you. The part that resonates with my soul. I always believe that being like-minded is more important than sharing the same hobbies. We aren't just lovers, we're lifelong companions, walking the same path, not drifting apart and going our separate ways. She looked up, her amber eyes focused on me. I really like you, George. Can we both stop pretending from now on? I want to be with you forever. I was stunned. I wanted to say a lot, but when I opened my mouth, it all turned into emptiness. I had never been firmly chosen by anyone. My experiences growing up had left me with no hope for love. So. I habitually used methods, tactics, to obtain affection. I thought this was the right way, that it was okay. So many people in the world just settled for a partnership, living life together. True love only existed in novels and movies, like ghosts. Everyone said it was real, but no one had ever seen it. If you found someone you were comfortable with, that was enough. Who cared about love? I thought I was fine, until someone told me she loved the real me, that she wanted us to be together forever. She was different from Willow. Using my old tactics on her was an insult. In that moment, all my turbulent emotions turned into a vast emptiness. I could have said so many things to make Anna happy, but all I could do was nod dumbly. Okay, I promise you, Anna smiled. She rarely smiled, it was like ice thawing in a cold pond, revealing a hint of spring. She said, then I forgive you. Chapter 12 I started truly being with Anna. I stopped trying to analyze her preferences and instead gradually adjusted to her. I no longer made an effort to watch the movie she liked. Instead, after dinner. We'd cuddle on the couch and watch horror films. She seemed calm at first, but that night she had a nightmare and woke up with a start, throwing herself into my arms without saying a word for a long time. Just as I was about to fall asleep again, she whispered, Honey, can we not watch horror movies anymore? We stopped drinking red wine. I took her to a roadside stall to drink by Joe. She wasn't used to it, her face turning bright red as she coughed. I just laughed and patted her back, not wanting to be defeated. I later discovered she had secretly bought a lot of by Joe at home trying to build her tolerance. Willow left, and she didn't bother me anymore. I heard she'd removed her tattoos, dyed her hair back to black, and returned home to be a good girl. In early March, Anna accepted my proposal. Somehow, Willow found out about the engagement and insisted on meeting with me. After discussing it with Anna, I arranged to meet Willow halfway up a hill, overlooking the sea. Waves crashed against the rocks below, seagulls circling in the sky. Willow wore a white dress. Leaning against the railing, she handed me a hot drink and took a sip herself, trying to sound casual. How long have you two even been together before getting engaged? I smiled. When you're with the right person, you don't need to wait long. She scoffed but then fell silent, looking out at the ocean. After a long time, she spoke. George, what about me? You played with me, got tired of me, and tossed me aside. Now you're happy, but what about me? I said. There are so many people pursuing you. Why worry? Surely you'll find a good man. I smiled and gave her a light pat. When Willow didn't smile back, I withdrew my hand and softly said, Willow, you never really loved me. If you had, you wouldn't have betrayed me over and over while we were together. You're just upset that I broke up with you first. Willow didn't respond. Sipping her drink slowly, I handed the hot drink back to her. I wish you happiness, and I mean it this time. Then I turned and left. I had walked quite far when Willow suddenly called out to me, her voice trembling. But George, I really did love you. I didn't stop. I waved back at her and kept walking. My phone chimed, a message from Anna. I've built up my tolerance. Tonight, let's settle it at the barbecue place downstairs. I couldn't help but smile, replying. All right. Loser buys the drinks. In the distance, the sky stretched endlessly, 
Sunlight breaking through the clouds, spring had truly arrived. 